Um, and Sam and Wendy, uh, alongside all the other things they've been doing, um, have been learning about how machine learning um, can help us to understand what we're doing in economics education. And that's what they're going to talk about. Over to you. Thank you very much. Indeed, that's what we're going to do. And so you can see lots of words on this uh, as background for this slide, and we'll, we'll explain where they come from. But the first thing is to, uh, to thank our collaborators. Uh, one year ago, we'd never heard of machine learning. Um, so uh, it's been a very steep uh, learning curve. And we've uh, worked with these collaborators, Sahana Subramaniam, from the very first core cohort at uh, Azim Premji University in Bangalore has been our research assistant on this project. So this is kind of, this is the core wheel turning. Many of you uh, may have seen this uh, uh, big piece in Bloomberg uh, by Noah Smith in March, uh, really drawing attention to the fact that Greg Mankiw was stepping down from teaching uh, the ec 10 course, the very famous ec 10 course at Harvard. And in that article, um, attention was drawn to the core project as, as an alternative. And uh, amazingly, um, yesterday, June the 24th, um, was this article in the Washington Post with a very similar theme. It's time to tear up our economics textbooks and start over. And in, in, the, in the Washington Post article, uh, it's, it's mainly um, explaining what's wrong with, with Mankiw, but uh, the, the only alternative that's presented in this article is, uh, is the core uh, approach um, with a link to, that takes you direct from the Washington Post page to, to the economy. So this is, um, yeah, somehow there's resonance uh, to, to, what, to what we're all collectively engaged in. And if we think about uh, when was the last time, the, the previous occasion on which there was a really a major uh, upheaval in the problems that economists were being led to think about, then we're taken to s some 70 years ago with the Great Depression. Some of you will recognize this slide from uh, Unit 17 in The Economy. And it wasn't just a time where new problems, the, the, how, could, how could the problem of uh, persistent high unemployment be accounted for, what kind of policies could deal with it. Uh, it, was, it was a time as well of new economic thinking, new economic theory. And uh, the, the, the textbook writer, so the first um, writer of a modern economic textbook, Paul Samuelson, uh, who, who published uh, his, his very famous text, Economics and Introductory Analysis, in 1948, he uh, very specifically drew attention to the comparison between uh, what was being taught in economics and what was being taught in physics and saying that uh, that really uh, teachers of econ why should teachers of, of ec economics withhold from the first year course the really interesting and vital problems of overall economic policy uh, the the physics analogy um, came to fruition in the, in, the, in the famous Feynman lectures, which were published in the early 1960s. Uh, so there, there's, people are often analogizing between economics and physics, and here, here I think there's, a, there's a, a, a very interesting pedagogical comparison. But of course, in physics, you don't have the, the pressure of the, of the changing world, the changing economy that we are being called to, to account uh, by our students in, in, in our classes if we are unable to bring them closer to those, uh, to those major events. In Samuelson's book, this is the very first question <coughs> that is set for students. How do you expect to fare in the next depression? That is question number one. Uh, he, he argues that the book is not primarily for professional economists, but for all those who uh, we now, uh, we're now quoted in this uh, Washington Post article uh, of reporting a fact that some 40% of college students in the US do one, at least one economics course. So that was the, the way that Samuelson was thinking. He said, it aims at an understanding of the economic institutions and problems of American civilization in the middle of the 20th century 
And very pointedly, he says, national income, right? Just think of Keynes. National income provides the central unifying theme for the book. And uh, again, a, a, a really striking parallel with what we're doing here is that he said as well that the methods of analysis used are those that have been employed by 90% of the active academic economists under the age of 50 over the last decade. So Samuel, Samuelson was saying there's a really important real world problem out there that we have to address. We have some new economic theory that we as researchers are working with and it's our duty, our obligation to bring that to, uh, to, uh, to our students and that is his kind of fanfare at the beginning of, of, of his text. It was a revolutionary book. It was a revolutionary table of contents centered on the concept of national income. So you can see here that where, uh, where Samuelson begins, the central problems of every economic society, then functioning of a mixed capitalistic economic system. If you haven't looked at the 1948 version of Samuelson's economics, then you will definitely learn something and enjoy it, uh, enjoy the experience as much, uh, as much as we have and be as surprised as uh, Sam and I were when we, um, when we dug into uh, Samuelson's initial text. And you can see put into, pay, uh, into part three is the chapter 19. So this is chapter 19, which is, appears on page 447. Okay, keep that number in mind. On page 500, uh, uh, 400, this is a typo. 457. Typo here. Yeah. That's 457, 10 pages, 10 pages later. Okay, this is, a, uh, this is kind of spoiled the surprise. So he, he dedicates 10 pages to this supply and demand. And then he says, this is all there is to the doctrine of supply and demand. <laughs> All that's left to do is to point out some of the cases to which it can be applied and some to which it cannot. And he makes this the, the point immediately, if marginal cost is falling, the firm has every reason to expand its output further. Okay, so that he's, he's saying, all right, we've talked about U-shaped cost curves, but the world is not like that. We have to be teaching in a world in which there, there are falling costs. Uh, and he says uh, the second part is not a th just a theoretical refinement. It shows us how and why competition tends to, tends to break down. So he then has this nice little table where he says, okay, this 10 pages were of use for understanding a few agricultural industries. So where's all the action? Here, monopolistic or imperfect competition. That's where the economy that his students were living in, that they were experiencing, that's, that's where it's at, and that's what should be the, the centre of attention. So what, what Wendy and I thought we would do is just have a look at, um, at Samuelson with respect to what we're doing today using a, a text analysis uh, and also drawing upon the work of Thomas Kuhn. So the idea is uh, to use what's called topic modelling, which is a Bayesian machine learning statistical techniques for anal analysing texts. And, and put that together with the idea from, um, from Kuhn of scientific uh, revolutions. And remember, uh, Kuhn said the scientific community's paradigms are revealed in its textbooks. So what good undergraduates learn is the content of a paradigm, that's according to Kuhn, and we decided to follow that. But we also want to look at it now quantitatively. So we'll say a bit about topic modeling. Uh, and. Um, well, what we're then going to ask, was Samuelson 48 a paradigm shift? There are a lot of ways you could answer that. Topic modeling is but one of them. Uh, Wendy has also already given you a good reason to think that probably uh, it was. Um, now, if you look at the market-leading text now, Mankiw, Krugman, Wells, and so on, um, th uh, they represent the, uh, um, uh, the, the current paradigm. Uh, but um, uh, do they address the, the new problems in the way that Samuelson tried to address the new problems associated with the Great Depression? And by the way, I would add also the Second World War and the Bolshevik Revolution, all of which were very much on Samuelson's mind when he wrote that book. Uh, then uh, does CORE ad address these problems? And if it's different from Krugman-Wells and, and Mankiw, 
uh, along the dimensions which we'll define using uh, this machine learning technique, in what ways uh, is it different? Finally, we're going to say something using the same techniques about where economics is going. We're going to give you a map of, in topic space, how economics has evolved, uh, where it seems to be headed. And uh, because uh, a number of you asked about this, we'll locate some texts at the intermediate level. Where, where are they in this topic space, and where's the research uh, corpus? Um, so most of you haven't heard of topic modeling, probably. Wendy already admitted we're neophytes in this, but we have had a very quick learning, a very intensive learning. Uh, so here's the idea. Um, the, um, uh, suppose you tried to imagine what were the topics in the mind of an author when he or she wrote a text. And the topics are going to be vectors of words, more or less like in a principal components analysis. It's a long vector of all the words you could possibly put into that text. Uh, and um, now, as I said, if you wanted to know what was on Samuelson's mind or Carlin's mind when she wrote Core, you could ask her or you could read the text and so on. But this is a way of essentially reverse engineering what likely was the kinds of words and concepts on the individual's mind. So what we're going to do is we just observe the words in the text, not their order, not their meaning, uh, and then we try to essentially infer uh, through this reverse engineering idea the uh, topics. Um, and uh, it is, it's Bayesian in the usual sense. It essentially says, here's some observations. What model could have produced them? <coughs> That's <coughs> a standard um, method. I'll say a bit more about uh, topic modeling before going on. <coughs> we start with a set of n words. Uh, it's a very large number, words or uh, uh, phrases, um, and, uh, um, and we have a set of documents which we're going to find those words in. So we extract all those words from the D documents. I'll tell you what the documents are in the next slide. Um, what we don't know is how they got there, how the words got into the documents. And we're going to try to infer that by defining these topics, that is by the, mach the, the machine learning algorithm itself defining the, uh, the topics. So there are a couple of assumptions. The most the striking one, which you've already probably noticed, is that a document is a bag of words. Uh, that's all it is. It's a collection of words. I'll show you in, in just one slide the matrix of documents and words that we use. Um, the, um, uh, what we bring to this is first we have to decide what number of topics do we use. We picked 100. And if you ask us why 100? will tell you, oh, that's approximately how many topics there are in the JEL codes, or some answer like that. There's no real <laughs> reason for 100. Uh, it's just uh, it's very commonly used, and it does happen to be about as many uh, JEL codes as they are. We pick the documents. I'll, I'll, sh I'll say what they are in a minute. Uh, we name the topics. We have a vector of word weights, and we say, oh, what does that look like? I'll give you an example at the bottom of this slide. We, we stem, that is, we, yeah, a word can appear as an adjective, adverb, and so on. It's, not, it's just still the same word. Um, uh, and we eliminate uh, prepositions and so on. Um, just to give you a, a this is topic four. Uh, these are the weights on the words. Uh, so quality, car, merger, and so on. You look at this, and uh, obviously, this is a very long list. It's actually a list of 10,000 of these. We look at the top ones. And we say, mm, that looks like adverse selection. So we, did, we named that adverse selection. So that's obviously a judgment on, on our call. Now, ha have a look at the corpus here. Uh, we take the, all the papers from these journals from 1900 to uh, the present. Uh, uh, we, um, we stem and eliminate stop words. And this gives us, this is the number, a, a token is a word or a bigram. Uh, so we have 10,000 or uh, almost 11,000 uh, words uh, in these vectors. Uh, and so what we want to explain is this matrix W. So for example, uh, this is the occurrence of word one in document two. And as I say, we have document, uh, the number of documents here, that's 27,000. The number of words in this direction is 11,000. So it's just a large matrix of observations. So now, um, there are two pieces of information we're going to use, both of which we think are insightful. So uh, we first want to ask, um, uh, uh, we, 
we want to look at a topic and say, what does the topic look like? Now remember, uh, the, these, are, these are like the, the documents, right? This is the Kabira market outside of Nairobi. These are bags of words. They, they look like beans and some of the, these are documents, actually. Uh, so they're just bags of things. Um, now, um, we have k topics, and therefore we have k vectors, 1 times n. Uh, and that's just a series of weights, a sum to 1, over the 10,000 or so words. Uh, and uh, I'll give you illustrations of some of those topics. Adverse selection was one of them, but I'll give you some others as well. Uh, now, a way to see what's, uh, what, we're, what we do here is, suppose we have just a vocabulary of three words. Uh, and the words are equilibrium, strategy, and money. And then in this simplex, uh, uh, Wendy and I have located two topics. The, the, the coordinates of any point in the simplex sum to one. So you can read from point A that it has this weight, this weight, and this weight. Uh, the weight uh, from here to here is the importance of money. The weight from here to here is the importance of equilibrium. And the weight from here to here is the importance of strategy. So the closer you are to a vertex, the higher the weight. And remember the weight sum to, to one. So if you think about this, <coughs> topic A could be maybe game theory. You know, it's, it's, big on, uh, it's very big on strategy, it's not very big on money, and so on. Whereas maybe topic B could be monetary economics. So that's basically the way this thing is constructed, of course, in much, much higher dimensions. Uh, and so this gives us the matrix of the topics. So this is, uh, uh, this is word one in topic uh, two, and so on. So that's part of the apparatus that we construct. But now we have to look at... Um, the distribution of topics over documents. That is, which, which topics were associated with which documents. So this is the next step that we do. How do topics get to put words in the bag of words of a particular article? I'll show you an example, Solo's uh, growth model, the topics that, what, that hypothetically could have written that. Um, and um, what we have then is uh, for every article, for every document, we have a distribution over the topics. The topic most likely to have been part of that and so on. Uh, now, this is another simplex. It's the same kind of thing, but it represents different data. Uh, this is uh, the, these are the three topics that could have contributed to writing a hypothetical paper, how a central bank sta stabilizes aggregate demand. And um, so this is topic uh, one. Uh, this is... Um, principal agent, you see, well, that wasn't really a big part of it. Uh, but um, regulation was a big part of it, as was fluctuations. So that's a distribution across the topics to explain a particular paper. Uh, and that gives us this other matrix theta, which is just the matrix of distributions of these topics across uh, the various articles. Uh, uh, now, this is Solo's paper. And these are the topics that wrote his great 57 paper. Uh, this is a topic called growth models. You can see the words that are in growth models with heavy weights are growth, dynamic, steady state, output, long run, and so on. Uh, and uh, there is, you know, this is basically a use of some kinds of math, production functions, and so on. So this is the description of the, the thematic structure of Solo 56. Uh, now, to summarize, these are the observations, the words in the documents. And these are the two things which we infer from the machine learning that allow us to predict how many occurrences of each word we're going to find in each document. Uh, that's the, um, uh, the uh, a way to think about this is that the words got into the documents by first probabilistically choosing a topic say, uh, um, growth, and then from that, from that topic, choosing a word, and that's how one of those words got into Solo's article. And you do that until you've got enough words for an article. Uh, in fact, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to show you how to, how to actually do that. Um, obviously, there's, a, there's an optimization method, which we don't have to go into. But I want to show you something of more use, and you can do this at home. Um, this is how to, with high probability, win the Nobel Prize. And it doesn't take a lot of effort. Wendy and I learned how to do it, and we're sure we're going to get it. Uh, so 
the first thing, I mean, the kit comes with these two uh, wheels that you can spin. Uh, and uh, so for um, the, um, the first thing you do is select some paper that you'd like to have a paper like that's going to win you the prize. So, you know, maybe it's Solo 56 or something like that. Uh, so then um, you, uh, uh, you find uh, these, one of these topics. Uh, the solo vector tells you what the, what the probable topics are. And with probability, these are the various probabilities. So for example, this could be production functions. You saw that was one of the topics it, that produced solo. So you spin this wheel. And then if it comes up on this, uh, then uh, that, that tells you that that topic is going to be uh, in solo. Um, and uh, you have to get a, a non-plastic bag and you know, label it my solo and put the word in. And then you'd continue doing that. Uh, uh, oh, then, then you have to spin this thing here to see which word from the topic you're going to put in, having chosen the topic. And that gives you uh, a word to go in the bag. Then what you do uh, is uh, you, you basically, having put a word in the bag, having probabilistically chosen a topic and then a word from the topic, that gives you the first word. And you continue doing that for as many words as you need to publish something in the QJE. So I mean, you, you know roughly what that is. Uh, and um, the, um, then you submit the paper, uh, you, it, uh, <laughs> taking care of the usual things you do when you submit papers to QJE. Uh, and uh, then um, you write some code to repeat this, because you don't want to have to do it over and over again. Uh, and then you just chill. <laughs> you order the champagne. I mean, that produces Solo 56, or something quite like it in terms of. Uh, now, um, so that gives you some idea of what we're extracting from the observations is a set of themes. Uh, but, I th but I think we should let you see a little more about how it actually works out in practice, which Wendy will explain. Right, so this is getting, uh, forget the chilling, this is getting more practical. Uh, under the bonnet. So what we're going to do is to look at some empirically estimated topics and to try and kind of convince you that uh, this method is, is making some sense of this large corpus of, of economics research. So this is uh, topic one, uh, which is labelled Modern Theories of Wage Determination. You can see here that the work is a wage, worker, job, pay, labour supply, offer, paid, blah, blah, blah. And then the, here are the, uh, the documents from, from that big corpus which are most heavily weighted in this topic. Okay, so that the, you're getting two kind of um, two fixes on, on the topic of modern theories of wage determination. So this is, uh, with probability <coughs> four, the word wage is going to be used whenever topic one is found to contribute to a document. So there's an awful lot of wages in these highly weighted documents here. And then here, with, with probability four again, topic one contributed to the generation of Falk et al. So that, that's how it works. Another one, uh, you saw that just this snip here of the adverse selection. And here you can see again the, uh, the articles that are most heavily weighted in this particular topic. So this is saying nothing about the value of these articles, right? It's just saying that these are the articles from that corpus that are, that are most heavily weighted in the topic. So yeah, these are the five documents um, that, that ha carry the highest weight for topic four. Here are some more. So this is topic 10. Bargaining and incomplete information, topic 20, game theory and behavioral economics. Uh, so you can, if you're really interested, uh, you can look at the whole hundred, um, the hundred uh, word clouds like this, and then the five um, articles that are most, most heavily weighted in, in, that, in that particular topic. <laughs> if we look at Lucas's f famous 1975 article, An Equilibrium Model of the Business Cycle, then you can see that it's most heavily weighted in 83, which is equilibrium stability formal results. It's got a lot of growth theory. It's got business cycles, et cetera. So that you're, you're led to think that 
uh, these, uh, that this method is actually, um, it has, has some, some credibility. This is a homage to Alan Kruger. Uh, so this is the Card Kruger um, paper with uh, heavily weighted in wage determination and then applied econometrics, cross-section and panel, sales strategies, public regulation, measurement, etc. So this is, you can uh, again choose every, any particular your favorite article and ask for the weights to be identified for the, uh, for the uh, topics that have fictively or, uh, written that paper. So that's kind of a, uh, that's about uh, the, the technique and, and what we then wanted to know was having taken this corpus of uh, more than 100 years of e economics research, how could we bring that to the question of whether Samuelson really marked a change in, uh, in economics textbooks and, and we'll, we'll carry that further forward. So this is a comparison between Samuelson 1948 and the immediately preceding text by Richard Ely. So when you go to the American Economic Association, there's always the Richard T. Eli or Ely lecture. That's him, that's this guy, who, uh, who had a, uh, an introductory textbook before Samuelson. And what the, so uh, what we've done here is to find a, a visualization of all the information that, uh, that the topic modeling process turns out. And the way we've done it is to, uh, to, if you think about the white bars or the open bars, that's the topic weight, uh, and it's on the right for Eli, and it's on the left for Samuelson. And then the dark bar is the absolute difference between the two. So you can see what are the topics that are most heavily weighted in Samuelson that were not in Eli. So that's fluctuations in aggregate demand, aggregate demand consumption. Okay, so that's what I told you uh, many minutes ago. Um, now we've gone via the topic modeling process and confirmed uh, that difference with Eli. You can see that uh, the previous book was very focused on institutional matters, business organizations, economic history, public regulation, transportation. There were big topics in the previous way economics was taught, and this was, this was the new, uh, and you can see here also the, uh, the Marshallian topics on the micro side being brought in much more strongly in Samuelson than had, be, had characterized the more descriptive approach of Eli. So that was then, and this is now, and we're, we're now thinking about you know, what, what are the big problems that we're facing. Uh, uh, many of you will have seen the, the word cloud. This is the cumulative word cloud uh, with the results from some 4,000 students uh, from 12, at least 12 countries now we've, we've got these from. Um, over the last few years, and you can see that the, the, the big problem is, is not the, uh, uh, the one that Samuelson was characterizing, but is uh, inequality in some countries. So when you ask the question in uh, France, you get a big weight on unemployment. Uh, elsewhere, it's inequality, uh, sustainability, uh, problems of uh, financial uh, uh, stability, and so on. We could blow up this this section over here. And it, the reason these, these words here are so tiny is because of the absolute dominance of inequality as a response that comes back from students who are asked the question of what's the most pressing problem uh, economists should be addressing. So our question then is, is whether this is another Samuelsonian moment. Is this the moment where we really need to change what we're doing in economics teaching to address the uh, 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 the new problems, but also to take advantage of the way that we are doing economics, of what economics research is and has been over the past 30 or so years that's simply not in those uh, standard textbooks. So this is uh, a, a way of asking that question of what's happened to the research corpus using exactly the, the same visualization that I used before. So here we're contrasting the research corpus so this is um, 1945 to 60 is to the right. And you can see there's really a break here in the, uh, in the bars. And it's the uh, recent corpus 2000 to 2014 to the left. So have a look 
at the topics that were really dominating economics research in the, the golden age. So fluctuations in demand, the, the standard topics that we, that we see, s s saw in Samuelson, and then if we look at uh, the research corpus that we are part of, then we see a set of very different topics. So starting at the bottom, there's much more econometrics, there's strategic interactions, distribution, equilibrium signaling, experimental design, again, so it's both time series, it's applied and, and, and cross-section and panel econometrics. So much, much more applied work, behavioral economics and, and game theory, and going up to labor market search and matching. So the, the topics, the subjects of research have changed dramatically. What Feynman said he was doing is taking the stuff from the back of the book and putting it at the front of the book. And that's also what Samuelson said he was doing. Uh, and, uh, but Samuelson found out that if you put new stuff at the front of the book, you have to rewrite the whole book. And that's why Core said, let's forget about the 15% rule that says you can only change 15% of the content of a textbook from uh, when you introduce a new one. Let's, let's, um, let's just forget that. And I mean, Wendy and I were just uh, sort of speculating. If that had been what we were constrained to do, we wouldn't have done it. And, uh, and I think most of the people who've been part of this process, Margaret and Camilla and everybody in this room, I think we would have said, no, I've got better things to do than do that. But it, once you put this new stuff at the front of the book, it's kind of uh, a big challenge. And uh, very, uh, it's really fun to see what happens in the rest of the book. So let me give you some examples. Um, we put uh, you know, the hockey sticks right at the beginning of the book. That's wealth creation innovation. So then there's some things that really have to come right along, and they do in, in unit two. Schumpeterian rent, dis disequilibrium dynamics, creativity of the market, that all comes in, not all in unit two, but somewhere. Uh, and so there's a lot here. I mean, you know, there's uh, Agion and, and Howitt, Mikowski in Australia, Hayek, and so on. Of course, Schumpeter. Uh, um, if environmental stability is at the front of the book, as it is in Unit 1, then we have to introduce things that have now been stressed in behavioral economics, in the work of Eleanor Ostrom and so on, non-market interactions, other regarding preferences, and so on. Uh, if inequality is a big topic, then obviously we have to have something about economic rents, power, uh, institutions, uh, behavioral uh, aspects of inequality. Um, Unemployment fluctu and fluctuations, we now have theories that can do a lot better than Samuelson was able to do uh, using uh, models of incomplete labor and credit markets and so on. Uh, and um, of course, financial instability. We have to make good use of the idea of prices as information, taking that one, of course, from Hayek uh, and the way in which that, the, that very fact can lead to bubbles as well as convergence to an equilibrium based on fundamentals either way. Um, the, um, uh, Kuhn said that an, a paradigm a, a tr a asks, what are the fundamental entities under study? How do they interact with each other? What qu questions can be asked about them and what techniques are employed? Uh, and he goes on to say, it's very interesting, Kuhn always connected the paradigm to education. Answers to these questions are the educational initiation of our students. Um, and so um, I want to lay out a, a, a view of the conventional paradigm here. And what we call the core paradigm, uh, of course, the, uh, the jury is out about whether or not it will cohere as a, a powerful and uh, analytical framework. We think it does, but right, it's perhaps too early to say. I'm not going to go through all of them, but this is just a list of things that we think a paradigm has to say something about. You've got to say, what are people like? Uh, you've got to say something about the relationship between the economy and the biosphere, uh, and so on. What are social interactions like? What kinds of information are available? Uh, what are contracts like? Uh, w what are the institutions on which you focus? Uh, um, what is technology? I mean, is it, for example, is increasing returns a big phenomenon, or, or is it something that you try to sweep under the rug? Uh, uh, Competition, what forms does it take? What, what models of that do you have? How does history come in? 
Does it illustrate your clever models or does it provide real challenges for theory building and the kinds of problems you want to solve? Um, age and heterogeneity. People could be different in their preferences or they could be different in the structural positions they occupy in the society as employers and employees, as lenders and borrowers, as what the classical economists would have called class heterogeneity. Does power come in at all, or is it just something which governments have and nobody else does? Economic rents, what role does it play? Uh, stability and instability, uh, and policy and evaluation. We lay these out in our JEL paper. By the way, if you want to find our JEL paper, the easiest place to find it is to go to Greg Mankiw's webpage, honestly. I mean, I, I, I didn't have a copy. And so I, I you know, sometimes you Google yourself, right? I, so I, 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 I Googled Car Carlin Bowles 101, because I knew that was in the title, because I want to get it quickly. And, and Mankiw's webpage came up. What's that about? No, it's, it's there. Uh, he really loves our paper because in a footnote we say that his, his uh, textbook is written in a way that's intelligible uh, to just about um, everyone. Uh, oh, the provenance. Yeah, let me say something about this. This really is what's in Samuelson. Uh, Marshall, Valra, and Keynes. And obviously, I've mentioned Hayek, but also Nash, von Neumann, Schumpeter, Coase, Ostrom, and so on. A much richer and more current body of theorists uh, uh, that, uh, that we have drawn upon. OK, so this is, uh, Mankiw hasn't quite put this on his web page yet, um, but he leads you there, because uh, you can just click on the JL article. Um, right, so this is a comparison between Mankiw and Core. And again, set up in exactly the same way. So you can see the things that, that are, are very different in the core text than they are in Mankiw. So there's much more em emphasis on comparative. It's a, it's a very global approach. Uh, game theory and behavioral economics, innovation, more economic history, history of economic thought, a focus on institutions, on democratic political competition. Um, you'll love the crops. Uh, crops crop up um, in all textbooks. We find that this, this is just, if you want to look from Samuelson, Eli Samuelson to Core, then you can't avoid uh, the use of, of grain or, or crops. Um, and then all the way up through to environmental and, and natural resources. And the, 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 the specialization of Samuelson is in competition and market structure, has more on monetary policy and inflation, money supply and demand, welfare effects of taxes, uh, advertising and consumer demand. So if this, this is what you think economics is about, then that's what you get explained extremely clearly in Mankiw. If this is what you think economics is about and you, uh, you, you think these are the questions that economists should be addressing, then that's what you will find in, in core. Uh, this came up earlier. This is a really important conversation that, uh, that we will have in, in the side conversations. I, even, I think I heard people talking about it in the first break that we had. Uh, we, we have some experience with this, um, uh, and so, so do many of the people in the room who've been teaching CORE for some years. Uh, the, the only piece of, of kind of small piece of evidence that we have uh, quantitatively was just to take that very, very first batch of guinea pigs at UCL who did the first beta version of CORE. They all did it. They were not expecting it. It was certainly a surprise. Um, and, and we were, Antonio and I, and, uh, uh, were kind of fumbling around trying to teach this completely different kind of course. So we, our expectation was that if the students managed okay in their compulsory intermediate exams, we would be, we could sort of turn up to the next uh, departmental meeting. And we were extremely surprised to see the results in that of, of that very first year. So the black is the uh, is the first cohort that took core in their first year. The red is the last cohort who, that didn't take core. And these are the results in the intermediate exams. So what we saw in both micro and macro was a shift in the distribution to the left and uh, some particular 
problems that we, we have, have had um, with the tail of the distribution, students just getting turned off, just sort of exhausted by those tough second year, those intermediate courses. Uh, there was less of a problem with that in the, um, with the cohort that had taken core, and there was, uh, shows up more in the, in the micro, the, the, at the top of the distribution as well. And we can talk more about these kinds of students um, uh, uh, in, in later sessions, and how core seems to be really attracting some, some of these high caliber students who probably would have become investment bankers, and we're now seeing at going to Chicago or wherever it is to do a PhD in economics. So there is some turning of some of the students, I think, at the, at the top end. Of course, you're just saying, you know, blah, 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 this was just a very exceptional year. Uh, well, in econometrics, nothing happened. So that was less likely to have been affected because in our implementation, uh, we didn't, uh, in fact, generalize core across to, to include the um, uh, uh, the econometrics. So there's some some small evidence there. Uh, we're going to close with some speculations about where economics is going and how we as a group, this global collaboration, might might fit into it. Uh, and uh, this is very new stuff. I mean, we're we're producing these results literally by the day, and so we haven't thought a lot about them. But what we do is we identify three meta topics. I'll tell you what they are. Uh, to represent the research corpus in both micro and macro, that is separately. We do something which we claim we never do, but we actually do use the words micro and macro here in the, in the next couple of pages. So for example, for microeconomics, uh, uh, we looked at these, these are the topics, these are names of topics, that is these one by 10,000 vectors of uh, words and their weights. And we said, okay, we're gonna call these market structure and competition. And then we're going to construct a meta topic simply by adding them, uh, add, adding their weights and dividing by five to get, a, again, a sum of weights that's sum to one. And this is the word cloud for the meta topic, which we call market structure and competition. Over here, we have individual level optimization and expected utility, which is an amalgam of these topics. And finally, strategic interaction and complete information, which is an amalgam of these topics. Uh, to be clear, these words here came from us. That is, these were things that we thought were essential parts of a theoretical construct called modern economics. Uh, and then we found these topics here as to constitute them. Um, now, um, uh, the, um, uh, this is a simplex in which topic two is here. So. Uh, suppose you were going to locate a text or a body of uh, research uh, in, in some place. Yes, you all have a picture of this. Could you get it out of your packet? And, and get a pencil out too, please. Uh, the so let me remind you, I'm going to ask you uh, to locate where do you think economics education, let's say in the second year, that is, for the people who are going on in economics, second year micro, let's say, what should they be learning in this space? And remember, if you put a point here, then it means that you think market structure and competition should be very important. That should be 70%. And it means that uh, these two topics here would be unimportant. So you're locating an X uh, somewhere in the graph. We're going to collect these. Uh, but you've got more work to do before we collect them. Uh, and uh, so this is basically, you're, you're, you're designing a course. Uh, your department chair said, go for it. And um, uh, Wendy and I want to assure you that if, if you ac actually uh, put a point somewhere, we will create a course for you by the machine learning technique. <laughs> it, will, it will just be a bag of words. You'll have to arrange them in some order, right? But you'll have all the words there. And we can do it, you know, it takes a couple of seconds. That's all. So please, please put... Uh, uh, a, an X, where you think the appropriate weighting for a second year micro course should be. Wendy, do you want to add something to the task? Uh, I'm, we're happy to take questions if you don't understand the task. So you, anywhere that's in the simplex, uh, the weights will add to one. Okay, you've got helpful guidelines uh, to help you interpret <coughs> it, which is the red ones are for the red topic, counting the weight away from the vertex. 
Okay, the green ones here, 90% weight on, on topic two would be down here. Right, 90% weight, see the red line here on topic zero would be up here. And the same for topic one. So, so to take an example, suppose you chose that point there. That would mean this topic zero would have a weight of 20? No, 80. Uh, 80, 80, yeah, we're sorry, <laughs> 80 uh, topic, uh, and, and the green topic would have a, a weight of uh, 10, and the same for the other topic. So, uh, but you don't have to actually read the numbers. Just say close to which vertex do you think it should be. I mean, should it be kind of in the middle, or should it, where should it be? Okay, please, I mean, it, this is not a, a hard problem. We all, do, <laughs> we all debate these things all the time, and I want to I move on to the macro which I'll also ask you to design a course in. That's I, on the back. Uh, that's, yeah. Uh, so have, the, have, have you all added your x's? I want to make sure you've all added your x's, because I'm going to show you where economics is and where the textbooks are. OK, so let's, let's move on. Here are the, the meta topics for macro. Aggregate demand, monetary and fiscal policy, which is composed of these component topics. Uh, economic growth, which is composed of these uh, topics, and uh, supply side, sort of modern supply side economics, labor market matching, credit and, and financial markets, composed of these topics. At the top, you have the word clouds for the, uh, for the meta topics. So you get some idea of what's in there. And once again, uh, this, uh, locate your ideal macro course in this space. Macro course for a second year student. The, uh, is it a, a year, a year's course, it's standard. The problem is we all pack everything in, mm. right? And no, it's, it's, it's standard it's second year macro course. Yeah. These, these are year long courses, and the fact that you try to do everything doesn't mean you spend equal time on everything. So you can think about how much time you would spend, or what fraction of their exam would be composed of topics 0, 1, and 2. Should I move on? I think we collect them first. I'll go and yes. collect them. Yes. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm coming around to collect them. So This, um, is, this is to prevent cheating, <laughs> because we're, we're now going to show you where economics really is and where it's going. And we don't want anybody changing, you know, like after you circulate the answers to the questions, the students change their And, answers. of course, anyone is free to sign their um, document if they want to. But yeah, you, you can but, also put Wendy's name on the macro <laughs> one if you want. But you don't have to. So, okay. so I'll just come and pick them up. <laughs> okay. Are there, are there any questions about this? You, you have to give them up, guys. I mean, Wendy. Yeah. So, so look for the blue line. She's doing a personal consultation. Yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing a personal <laughs> consultation. So that gives you a 20% uh, weight on the blue one. Okay. Okay. Wendy, you, you've got to collect them because I'm going to show the truth now. Okay, who's ready to hand over? Oh, very good. Okay, great. Okay. What I say in my, in my big class is, pencils down, right? <laughs> That's it. OK. Here is, here is the evolution of the research corpus since 1900. Uh, that is, this is micro. And it starts here in the middle. It moves very much up here. Uh, this is the 20s and 30s. Uh, notice. Um, this is basically, I can now interpret this, it looks to me like topic zero is Marshallian economics. And essentially, economics becomes more Marshallian in the 30 years after Marshall published his great book in 1890. Uh, it then um, uh, moves down in the direction of individual optimization. And when I was teaching micro to grad students, uh, in the 60s, all, you know, it was all just optimization. Op, you know, it basically changed the subscript, but it's all the same thing. Uh, <clears throat> but what's interesting then is here, from, uh, from the 70s, you already see a quite dramatic shift in the direction of strategic interaction. So this is basically, eventually people discover Nash, von Neumann, uh, this is when some of Stiglitz's important papers were written and so on, moving in the direction of principal agent models here. Uh, so that's what's happening, and, uh, and I think every reason to think it will continue in this direction to some extent. Now let's look at the macro. Uh, the, 
Mac but, but by the way, if you think I'm showing you the same picture, this is micro. That's macro. Uh, it's the same pattern. I mean, we couldn't believe it. Uh, and notice what's happening here. Uh, we, uh, I, you know, the, the topic zero is sort of standard Keynesian uh, economics. And that becomes very important. It's then replaced by growth. Uh, and then a little bit of a move towards what, uh, you know, what I call supply side labor credit, you know, the, the specific, uh, specificity of these important markets. And one thing you can see, it's very impressive, and as, as an economist, I'm proud to, to point this out to you. The, the financial crisis of 2008 really had a big impact on macro. Can you see it? You see it? It moved from there <laughs> to there. It really changed. Uh, OK, uh, because, because um, so many of you asked about you know, what about the rest of the curriculum? Uh, I'm going to engage in some uh, shameful um, or uh, shameless uh, promotion. This is Wendy's fantastic macro textbook. Many of you know it. It's widely in use. Uh, this is a textbook which Simon Halliday and I are just finishing. It'll be, like Wendy's book, it'll be published by OUP. Uh, it embodies a lot of these principles. Uh, and so um, let's, let's look at where the textbooks are. So the textbooks are these triangles. Uh, here's Marshall, Marshall 1890. So it's kind of like an intermediate level textbook, I guess. Uh, then we have Learners, Economics of Control, interestingly, also a very good uh, sort of second year uh, micro textbook. That's even more Marshallian than Marshall. But then the thing that I find really interesting is this is Stigler's theory of price. You know, this was the darling of Chicago for half, half a century. And notice that uh, Stigler, Stigler the Chicago guy, and Lerner the socialist, they're located in exactly the same place. And not only that, Appendick and Rubenfield haven't moved at all. I mean, they're still in the same place. And I don't know, th yes, uh, no, we also did Perloff and some other stuff. They're, they're basically up here. The only exception is Varian. Varian is there. So Varian really is different from this straight Marshall, unadulterated Marshall. Uh, and this is where uh, Simon Halliday and my text is located in topic space. Uh, so obviously, I mean, I really like this because it's kind of following the research <laughs> <laughs> trajectory. Uh, and this is, uh, again, this is the historical movement of the macro. And these are the textbooks. And here we look at Carlin Soskis, which is there, uh, Jones, Blanchard, and Mankiw. And um, I mean, you see, jo this makes a lot of sense. We, you know that Jones is all about growth, and it's just exactly where it should be towards the growth dimension. Uh, and uh, thanks for your patience. There's a lot of stuff to do in the world. <laughs> I mean, but by the way, have you noticed that things are going our way? <laughs> thanks. don't have time for questions. Is that right? Do we, uh, uh, we started are you happy a little late. To? Okay, yeah. we did. You're, you're right. So, so uh, any, any questions, if you could make them succinct, that would be great. Oh, maybe we... Very quick. When you compare... Sorry, very quick. When you compare... You know, you said... Sorry, I put my computer away. I had my question written down. But have you compared your book, uh, sorry, Core, with Ellie... Eli, how do you call? Yeah. Because it's very interesting. From Eli to the following book, we see a change in the topics, right? But a lot of the topics that are now in core, like institutions, like um, economic history, were in that book, but they disappear from the other book. So it seems like going back to where we started. Yeah, I think uh, we have actually got all of the bilateral comparisons of everything un that you can probably ever think of. Um, uh, and, and they are, they are quite interesting. Um, so there is a big difference between Core and Eli, but it's not the same difference as the difference between Mankiw and Eli, for example. And you're right, there's some, some of the institutional uh, topics that were very prominent in Eli, but they're captured, interestingly, by different topics. So, so his is very heavy in, for example, regulation, uh, transportation, named organizations, so like the Federal Reserve, for, uh, 
for instance. Um, and in, in the topics that covering what, what, we, what we interpret as institutions, so rules of the game rather than named organisations, they show up under a different topic in, in core. So that there, the, there's a good match, say, with economic uh, history and history of economic thought. So that's definitely a, uh, where there's a, a, a similarity between uh, some of the earlier more institutional economics and core. But there's no, um, there's no uh, close match. And if you want a close match, then you have to go to a different contemporary book now, a book by Goodwin um, and, and co-authors, which are called uh, Economics in Context, so Microeconomics in Context, Macroeconomics in Context. And those books are much more descriptive, and they look more like Eli than they look like either Core or Core looks like Eli. Very quickly, so this, this graph that you were showing about what happened to intermediate micro, macro, and econometrics at UCL, I think it's very important since I've seen many people that, that are trying to push this in their institutions and so on, and there's a skepticism. I think this, is, this was really important for us. Mm -hmm. At the beginning, there were quite a few of, of our colleagues that were skeptical. And the students themselves were very skeptical because this looks different from what I've seen in A-levels and are we going to cope later on? This has completely disappeared because the students themselves, when they talk to upper level students and so on, they, and they ask them, they say, you know, there's no trouble. It's actually even better, so don't, don't worry. And our colleagues have experienced the same. So I think it's a very important reflection on this. Thanks, Antonio. Judith Shapiro, LSE. I want to put something on the agenda. I don't expect you to respond to it now, but at the end of this uh, session tomorrow, uh, some of my colleagues strongly believe that we should start dissolving the distinction between micro and macro, and most of them are macro colleagues, and I guess I would think of it, as I think of it now, that that distinction is in some sense Samuel Samuelsonian. So I think we should think about that. I'm not immediately convinced myself, and I would certainly like someone like Wendy Carlin's view that is another macroeconomist, because I don't want to yeah. see it be a micro takeover. Yeah, so, so just to uh, put, put it in context, so it actually came up in another comment, um, Robin's comment earlier on, that the core, so the core approach absolutely um, eschews the, the, uh, the separation between micro and macro, and the reason is because of the, of the long, do you remember the long uh, uh, slide that Sam showed comparing the two benchmarks? And what, what brings micro and macro uh, teaching together is that you need, that, that if you build a micro rooted in heterogeneous agents, so you have distinctive employers, employees, lenders, borrowers with different positions in the economy, then that, and, and that's how you, uh, and so you develop the, the, uh, the, the decision making of those actors. So when we think of the model of the firm setting the wage, responding to the, uh, to the best response uh, in terms of effort of, of the worker in a situation of incomplete contracts, that gives you, for example, the requirement that there be involuntary unemployment in, in, in the equilibrium of the whole economy. So, so it's very natural taking the, uh, the contemporary economics approach to teaching micro that leads you into macro without then having to bring in ad hoc assumptions about stickiness and, and all kinds of weirdnesses like ADAS and things that, that no practicing macroeconomist ever thinks about except if they've got some old slides that they use to teach their course. So I think that it's, it is very a natural part of, uh, of creating, um, of creating a, a new paradigm. And uh, we'll touch on this in several other sessions. And uh, I think it's, it's a great thing to come back to at the end. I want to, Thais Van Rens, I'm at the University of Warwick. I wanted to follow up on, on Antonio's comment with a question, really, which is it's impressive to see that evaluations, that, sorry, not evaluation, that performance in follow up courses improves because of working with CORE. It's also quite surprising because the rest of the talk was about how the topics covered in CORE are very different from the traditional curriculum, so presumably different from 
the topics that are then covered in those intermediate courses. So it almost sounds too good to be true. And I suppose my question is, have you got any ideas why you're finding that? Is that really about the topics or is it maybe about something completely different? So something that is important to mention in that context is that, as you saw, Varian is actually quite closer to the frontier in research than, than, the, pre, than the other textbooks. So what we're doing, in, in a sense, is approaching the intro, which was kind of disconnected to, to Varian. So in, in micro, that's very clear. I think in macro, what happens is that, it's that since, since Wendy is already teaching the second, the second the macro course, which is already closer to the frontier, we're just taking our students closer to what it's done in the second year rather than, than pulling them far apart as impossible. And I think one thing to add, which is uh, that throughout the, uh, the course, whatever the topic, more or less, uh, we're using a common set of, of modeling tools. So we're using, from the very beginning, the idea of the feasible set and indifference curves. That's again going to come up. Um, uh, over the next day or so. And so the students are in a different mood, if you like. They don't see a lot of the sort of reduced form supply demand pushing things around. They're in the, in the mood for thinking about how do actors, who are the actors, uh, what, why are the actors taking the de decisions they take. And that's the mindset of a more advanced student in economics. And interestingly enough, it's also the mindset of a neophyte who comes into economics without having done it at high school, who's interested in the world. And they are indeed interested in who the actors are and why they're doing what they're doing. So they find it a very smooth transition. And the really problem group is picked up in the first session are the ones who've come in through high school economics who think they know everything and are very uh, discombobulated by the fact that their peers who've not done economics get, catch this idea quicker than them. At the back. My, my, my question really follows, follows on from that comment. Um, you've talked about Kuhn as the basis of, uh, and paradigms as the basis of your analysis. What evidence have you found of incommensurability, which is one of the things which Kuhn argues that within disciplinary communities, or across disciplinary communities, it's very difficult to, um, uh, to have a discussion. And perhaps related to that, um, and not for discussion today, in terms of persuasiveness, have you thought how this might approach to, might, might relate to something like McCloskey's uh, rhetoric analysis? Um, and I'm particularly thinking of the paper in which he argues that Muth was a very important um, uh, contribution to macro, but a very poorly written uh, uh, um, an analysis, so that it actually ended up being Lucas and Rapping who got the credit for rational expectations. Mm. So. Well, I think the commensurability problem in economics arises primarily when we confront the, the existing world. That is, uh, we, you know, we, we have to try out our theories on things that come up and that policymakers or uh, business leaders or students uh, um, ask us. And uh, that's where the rubber hits the road. And that's, wh and that's why people are so interested, I think, in taking up core, because the questions that are coming are about climate change and they're about inequality and so on. As they were in Samuelson's day, it was how to, how to defeat communism in the third world, how to avoid a Great Depression, and, and so on. And these were, these were the questions on the table for people who had enough power to actually uh, favor the advance of a new paradigm. And uh, I think, so, so commensurability with us is really something which is a very slow process of uh, looking and seeing how successful these various models are in making sense of what's going on. And uh, I remember a long conversation I had with some very good economists who were teaching the first year course at Yale. It was wonderful that Yale had top economists teaching their course. They had fantastic topics for them to study, uh, very similar to the ones that we do in core, and then they had an absolutely traditional textbook. And I said, how's it going? Uh, you know, can you really deal with problems of inequality and climate change if all you're teaching is this? And, uh, and they said, well, yes, we have to do some ad ad added stuff about deviations from uh, this. And uh, Wendy and I had a conversation with the people who will be teaching Mankiw's course at Harvard. Um, and unbelievably, they said they're going to teach a labor market as a supply and demand intersection. And then all the stuff that's interesting, namely that we observe there, is going to be a series of, they counted them, nine deviations from the intersection. 
which is, I mean, it's really mind-boggling because there is a ready-made theory. It's been around for 30 years. It's taught to every grad student. It's called the principal agent model of the, the, the firm in the labor market, which doesn't, doesn't force you to have exceptions to explain things, but it falls out of the model. Now, I think that's why the, why the, the research paradigm is moving in that direction. <laughs> And that's why the, eventually the intro techs are going to move in that direction. Uh, that's, the, that, that's the commensurability. What was the... Um, Muth. The, 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 it's essentially the problem of persuasiveness. How, how, yeah. how do new ideas enter into your agenda? Oh, well, I think, I mean, I, I think there, once again, uh, there's a very, there are very simple kinds of statements that you can make using our framework about the way the world works. And it doesn't involve first teaching somebody a model and then teaching them the exceptions to the model. It, it just involves teaching them the model. And uh, I think that's where our persuasiveness comes, comes from, which is what they have learned in their course is not something they have to amend, extend, and so on. They, they have to apply it, of course. I mean, a simple model has to be applied with some you know, reasonable attention to facts and so on. But you don't overturn the model. Uh, you use it. And I think that as... Uh, the core is actually much more theoretical than people realize because people think it's cool and there's a lot of these topics and so on. But as Wendy said, we're relentless in teaching very simple problems like how do you use feasible sets in difference curves and so on, Nash equilibrium to, uh, to get results. And I think that um, I think our persuasiveness comes from the fact that if you've learned uh, what's in the economy, you've got a lot to say about things that people care about. And... Uh, and, and there's no necessity for all of the ad hocery that particularly macroeconomists have to engage in to get their models off the ground about this kind of stickiness or that kind of myopic family and so on. <laughs>